Welcome to Native Calgarian and Mossy for listening. I'm your host, Michelle Robinson, speaking to you in Mokinstis in the Blackfoot Confederacy, home of the Nitsitapi, Sutina Dene, and the Yiharhi Nakoda. I talk about history, current news, unheard news, book clubs, with special guests to give local or national issues a voice through an urban Satu Dene lens. My life's work will be to honor the voices of my ancestors and next generation with humor, love, and truth. Reconciliation is work, not performance. May we honor all Indigenous voices with that courage. Today is July 27th, 2024. Welcome to Native Calgarian. Oki, Naganago, Mekoche, Chestokom, Oki, or Nara Gorda. Let me try again. Nara Dago, the Dekots Nagotene, Siku, Saradi. So I attempted to say, my name is Red Thunder Woman. Please call me Michelle Robinson. Uh, my married English name is Michelle Robinson. I use she and her, they, them pronouns, but obviously Indigenous can call me by my spirit name. Uh, my Dene lineage roots me in the land of the Great Bear-like tribe in Treaty 11 in uh, Delany. I'm a native to Turtle Island, and my Dene nation is uninvited to this area of Klincho Tine Indahe in Satu Dene, meaning many big dog town, named after the Calgary Stampede. I was born in Calgary or in Blackfoot Mokinstis, as Michelle Elliott, an English name that has afforded me privilege in an English colonial world. My acknowledging proximity to whiteness is really important because the darker the skin, the more racism a person experiences in colonial spaces. My late great-grandfather is Milo Bewell from Delaline. His daughter, Alice, is my now late granny. My mother and I are Northern Slavey Dene or Satu Dene, but my Indian Act and Post status card by the Canadian government says Yellow Knives Dene. Through my father, I am a daughter of the Mayflower and a daughter of the American Revolution. Uh, having a Canadian Indian Act and Post status card is a colonial construct by Canadian policies meant to divide Indigenous peoples' inherent rights. Indigenous Two-Spirit, or the Indigenous 2SLGBTQ community, and Indigenous women are at the bottom of the Canadian socioeconomic ladder because of colonial trauma, imposed poverty, racism, gendered violence, and land theft. According to the 2023 Quality of Life Report by the Calgary Foundation, 21% of racialized Calgarians cannot actually find suitable employment. Uh, my Reconciliation Action Group is uh, very aware of that now, be watching what has happened to Indigenous people uh, through my friends, through me, and through others. I am not a social worker, an elder, nor do I speak on behalf of all Indigenous. I just share my journey as a newly diagnosed uh, person with ADHD, possibly autism, a Denny, mom <laughs> living and navigating this colonial, misogynistic, ableist, racist world in 2024. As a trauma-informed Dene who has attempted to run, joined harmful colonial parties, spent money to be at expensive conventions, left my home to travel to those conventions just to vote on incomplete policies that still allow for colonial incarceration, a denial of justice, a denial of health services, racism, colonial trauma, and genocide of Indigenous and Black peoples, I have work to continue, reports to advocate for, and attempt to work within these systems meant to harm me and my community. I think of all of this today, and I hope we honor the many Indigenous lives lost for the so-called country named Canada. I hope you see your role in the importance of stopping harm, and as a citizen, see your role in reconciliation and as a treaty partner. Pride Month should never just be one month. It's important to understand that the straight agenda and gendered violence was and is forced on these lands by Christian outsiders. Land acknowledgements are critical for creating a safer space for Indigenous and honoring the host as the guest and acknowledging your role as a treaty partner in a so-called time of reconciliation. Can they be performative? Of course. It's important that land acknowledgements have meaning and I encourage all folks to introduce themselves with an acknowledgement of their ancestors, stories of displacement, and how you perceive your role as a treaty partner, a citizen of Canada, a refugee, or whatever land displacement, so we as Indigenous people know how safe you are to be around. If you don't know how to pronounce your local Indigenous nations' names, you won't say your pronouns, you won't say your story of origin, 
won't acknowledge stolen lands, won't acknowledge imposed economic oppression your, or your role in reconciliation. I determine how safe you are to be around my community, my family, and myself, because we get the most colonial violence based on ignorance or worse, willful anti-Indigenous bias. Like, oh my God, I love old Canada. Let's celebrate Canada Day. <laughs> Understanding land acknowledgements and their importance is Indigenous 101 because it immediately addresses colonialism, oppression dynamics, broken treaties, and lies taught today in Canadian schools nationally. That's why settlers and those who call themselves native Calgarians or whatever town you're from, you show me you have no Indigenous 101 understanding. And Jesse Wente's book on Reconciled explains this perfectly, as do many Indigenous authored books. Land Back is a movement that could save the planet from climate change created by colonialism, but it would be part of respecting Indigenous rights, treaty partnership, meaning reconciliation, honoring global initiatives like the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And as a former drafter, I'd love be happy to teach you more, but you have to pay me. <laughs> I'm speaking to you on the lands of the Nitsitapi, which is the Blackfoot Confederacy. The Blackfoot south of the imposed U.S.-Canadian border are the Blackfeet or the uh, Umska Biganing. Uh, no, Umskan Bibigani. And north of the border are the Siksika, Gainai, and Bagani of the Confederacy. And actually, Bagani is about to have their big powwow uh, next weekend. So uh, this these lands are Treaty 7, signed September 22nd, 1877, with signatures that include the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Good Stony, formerly Wesley, the Chiniki and Bears Paw Nations of the Stony Nations, or the... Yes, they Naka uh, Dakota Nakota. Sorry, so let's say that one more time. Eth E yes. Hmm, I still can't get this. Dakota Nakota uh Nakota Wiska Bondike. Whis Wiska Tabe. Wiska Tabe. Wiska Tabe. So E Yathe Nakoda Wiskadabe and the Dene from Sutina Nation. I acknowledge all First Nation, Metis, Inuit, status and non-status across Turtle Island as the keepers of these lands. All non-Indigenous are treaty partners with the government signing on your behalf. My Patreon account is Native Calgarian, where you can pledge and support. Thank you to my previous donors for showing your support. If you value listening and watching and can afford to give, thank you. For those who cannot afford to give, I'd love to hear from you at nativeyyc at gmail.com, where you can send in your comments or questions. Also, giving a review helps whatever medium you're listening from. I have a YouTube channel that you can go and subscribe, or you can go to nativecalgarian.com for the latest podcasts and pin posts on social media. Now, speaking of feedback, wow, uh, my last one really struck a nerve with a lot of settlers. And they really replied about their journeys of learning about ADHD and autism. And I was sad. I was sad because we have a massive demographic of people that are too afraid to talk about it out loud, despite this let's talk bell bullshit that's out there. So uh, for folks who are listening, I do want to say thank you for sending me your you know, book recommendations. I really appreciated the affirmation that this um, Gabar Mente book is like he's still a white male coming from that perspective and sexism is rampant. So uh, I'll have to go through those book recommendations and podcasts that you all recommended. And I appreciate that. And I, I mentioned it to my daughter and uh, we've talked a lot about uh, the discrimination that uh, women and trans get in the community, the queer community. And she referenced this actually. And I, I, I thought I taught her this, but she definitely learned it and, and has gravitated to the concept that a lot of white gay men, because that's their one intersectionality, that that's why they act as if they are so oppressed. And she said to me that probably one of the reasons why you're getting that feedback is because like that might be the one intersectionality that uh, my settler uh, listeners have. So that's why they cling to it. And I, I was like, wow, that's that's pretty deep. Thank you, my daughter. Uh, very clever 
uh, person, obviously. And sometimes I'm shocked that she came from us. And in fact, we have a new massage therapist and uh, she said to me, oh, your your daughter's so sweet. And I laughed. I said, I, despite our best efforts. <laughs> so anyway, uh, very insightful. And I, I agree with her that sometimes that's like the only intersectionality. And I've been really angry unpacking all of this because again, like sometimes I don't know if it's because I'm gender coding, if I'm white coding, or if I'm just masking because I've undiagnosed autism um, on top of ADHD. So I get really angry at all of this because it's like, I have to act white, think white, know white politics at every order of government, including international politics, as well as knowing my own. And this is not a burden on settlers because they don't care. And I, I was going to talk about Jasper a little later, but I'll talk about that in a minute because it has been a hell of a week, hasn't it? Holy cow. So Trump's assassination attempt and all of these folks at the Republican Party wearing like a little Band-Aid on their earring and so, or in their ear in solidarity while having the audacity to call everybody else cultish. Oh, my God. I just I, I couldn't laugh harder at it. Um, I was the, the first thing I posted was you missed because uh, I was pretty, you know, <laughs> it it seems staged, but obviously it wasn't. And uh, this kid who who was uh, at the other end of it, like there was a lot of, I had seen videos within 10 minutes of the assassination attempt on Twitter. I had seen the kid that was um, on the roof within half an hour, videos were coming out of, of this and the secret service, like purposely not doing anything. And then I seen a whole thread talk about how the Secret Service has to wait to see if somebody shoots first in order to engage because um, that is an open carry uh, state. So a lot of misinformation out there, obviously, a lot of conspiracy theories that we've never seen before. It was pretty outlandish and shocking for me even. And I mean, so for folks who are, might be new to me, I mean, I've been talking about Indian residential schools and the issues that Indigenous people in Canada have been facing long before the TRC. So the only place that I had space to talk about that actually was in the 9-11 truth movement. So in the 9-11 truth movement, um, you know, obviously every conspiracy possible, always kind of debunking a lot of those things. And, and uh, you know, I had friends who... You know, they'd, they'd get so hyper-focused on a detail of 9-11, they'd have a heart attack, right? Like, this isn't a joke. And so at a certain point, I was like, this is really toxic. And that, and we've seen a lot of that infiltration from uh, the Republicans and Russia coming into the 9-11 truth movement. So it, at a certain point, I was like, yeah, this has become too sexist for me. And uh, I, I had to leave it. So like, you know, having previous relationships with like, you know, um, Dan Dix and and hosting um, folks like uh, the engineer, the 9-11 engineers and mechanics fellow, Richard Gage. I hosted him in, here in Calgary just to talk about this because, you know, as somebody who was really hyper fixated on building structure, like anyway, that's a whole conversation for another day. What I'm trying to talk about is the Trump assassination attempt, and my ADHD just went out of control there, and I apologize. Um, so the conspiracies are out there about, um, you know, this being fixed or not. And, uh, you know, I actually got in an argument over this with my dad because he doesn't think it's very nice for me to ever wish an assassination at attempt to be fully done. And, uh, you know, I, I was like, I, I thought that was his white male privilege showing because, you know, this is literally a man who like openly and proudly talks about molesting people. And he's just a piece of shit. Uh, obviously, convicted felon is like one of the many issues of this man. So anyway, I just thought it was really funny. And uh, and, and then they had the Republican convention and and honestly, after I seen that, I thought, oh, he just won the election. We're done. <laughs> There's no point even trying for Dems. But uh, yeah, and then something happened after that. But anyway, one of my favorite, favorite moments to make fun of, of the Republican convention. Absolutely. I feel so embarrassed for Kid Rock. Like, I can't even tell you how embarrassed I was for him. 
he actually went on there and like my husband keeps saying you know how old is this song like 20 years old 30 years old and he talks about being an American badass to like all seven people that were there that didn't know how to even dance to it like that's the funniest highlight ever of the Republican convention I laugh so hard I just every time I see that I laugh (laughs) I'm embarrassed for Kid Rock for the Republicans, for conservatives in America. Oh my God, my favorite thing, I swear. So, um, however, I will say this. So, you know, it is kind of a big deal. You know, he's running for president again. He's the former president of the United States. And, you know, pretty bad Secret Service moves there. (laughs) Oh my God, you must be so embarrassed. It really pissed me off that, People were blaming the woman, saying, well, this is what you get when you get a DEI hire. And uh, it's like, I don't think it was a DEI hires issue. I think it's your stupid systems issue. But regardless, here we are. So this lady uh, finally resigned. And I know that won't change a damn thing other than put another man in there. And it's just pathetic that, that they're so ass backwards down there that they think that you have to have a man. Like it. It's just the patriarchy is so sick down there and Canadians are so dumb. They just fall for it. We have our own problems. I'll talk about that in a second. So anyway, um, here we have this major attempt at the life of a former president, uh, you know, presidential candidate. And Canada looked at themselves and went, oh, no, 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 that would never happen here. Now, I've been around our prime minister numerous times since he has been become prime minister. And I will tell you, maybe I'll even say before that, when Harper was prime minister, I could not get an audience to see him while he was here in Calgary, like not going to happen. You know, we'd go down to his office, make the attempts. Uh, We did a few protests in front of his place there. And then the building got mad. So they're like, you guys aren't allowed on our property, which I found hysterical. Anyway, I brought this fellow, um, Manmut. He was one of the five folks that were on this like secret list of of no fly terrorists. And, you know, he was he was trying to be he was trying to advocate for his freedom. And uh, that's a this is a long, long time ago when basically um, they just decided who was if they didn't like a certain Muslim, they put him on a list. And and this person was literally confined to their house and uh, and really just imprisoned. There's no nice way to say it. So anyway, he came out to Calgary with another activist friend, uh, Syed Hussein, in in Toronto. A lot of you would know he's doing really great work with the Migrants Canada, et cetera, today. Anyway, you know, always advocating for rights. So we tried to go to Harper's office and we told them in advance we were coming. And so that was the first time they put a lock on the door and would not allow anyone in. That was the first time that I've ever seen anyone ever do that and this was when we were still doing video uh not necessarily on our phones yet though like we had cameras one have to upload later so like this was the technology at that time uh anyway fast forward to today you know justin he's on vacation in tofino with his his kids and this dumbass rebel news little kid comes up to him and and just start saying the most deplorable crap, like Pierre Polvier on stor- steroids, only he looks like a little boy. People call him Ki- Kaihu here. Um, anyway, he uh, he's trying to, you know, own Justin Trudeau on the beach. And of course, he, he just looks like an idiot. But I was really angry because I've been around Justin since he's been prime minister at liberal conventions, at um, public events. And I, I watch the RCMP, they go in with bomb dogs and they do scanning for everything. And uh, his actual security detail are around him all the time, doing preliminary checking out all that stuff, right? So to see this stupid rebel media idiot go up to him and take 15 minutes of his time, like I don't understand right after an attempted assassination of the president of the united states and this our people saying oh my god no that would never happen here like honestly this was i think a really big black eye to canada's 
Secret Service to Canada's uh, security detail of our prime minister. It it really is upsetting. I think Justin handled it beautifully. I'm always disappointed when I read people's stupid comments on it because I just think, you know, Stephen Harper was so unapproachable by media. He actually closed down the, the in the House of Commons. They actually had a whole room just for media that he just closed it down during his term. And none of these stupid conservatives ever spoke out against that. All of us did. But anyway, here we are. So when they reopened that parliamentary uh, media room, they literally had to teach the media because this had been 10 years. So new faces, new media. They had to teach them how to the protocols of how to do this at the House of Commons when the liberals got back in power in 2015. And and those are things I was quite proud of as a liberal. Right. Anyway. Um, just wanted to bring all that up because I just find it uh, really hypocritical to see the commentary for Trump's uh, assassination attempt versus Justin Trudeau being basically accosted on his vacation in Canada with his kids. And there no, there's not a huge outcry on that. And I, I'm just disgusted with conservatives and with the political commentary across the country um about it because it, it our prime minister should be able to go on the beach with his kids and that's just not allowed anymore and then conversely Stephen Harper he would never do interviews and and the fact that the secret service allowed this guy on the beach with him it's just deplorable it's disgusting um so some really sad news that happened over the weekend uh, I'm sure everybody have I mean, internationally, everyone knows what has Hasper, happened to Jasper National Park, to the Jasper town site as well. And um, it, it's it's really interesting. I, I just wanted to put this perspective out there because I did retweet um, Erica Violet Lee or Lee Violet. I can't remember. Erica Lee Violet, I think, is her name. She talked about the fact that Jasper is stolen land. And 100% it is. And many of you who have taken my... Land acknowledgement teachings know I have talked about the uh, relocation of, you know, the McMurray Métis, the uh, Jasper Métis, um, but it's just not hitting. Like, you know, when when you have a racist settler committed to being a racist settler colonizer, you just can't get that out of them, right? Like, they just don't think that way. And when they hear things like, you know, established in 19... Uh, in 19... Uh, 11 it's like that that's less than 100 years you've displaced somebody regardless canadians are like oh my god what is this so here we are so it, it's interesting seeing we've seen it with fort mcmurray we've seen it with jasper we've seen the overwhelming sadness that uh constantly comes out of settlers that are like alberta strong fort mcmurray proud now we're at Jasper Proud and where we will rebuild. <laughs> oh my God. You mean you will resettle the settlement you've already stolen from somebody else. And I just find it ironic that as sad panties as all of these Canadians are, not once have any of them considered that that sadness and that upset that they feel might just be a, a tinge of us, the Indigenous people who have lost their homes, been relocated, had multiple government traumas since we've been forced to be relocated. That that that's never connected with Canadians. So like I I I I'm sad too that Jasper burnt down, but I'm also sad that Canadians are so arrogant that they think only their pain matters and never the Indigenous peoples that they've actually displaced and relocated and then continue to do multiple traumas from child apprehension, whether it was for today in our stupid social services, whether it was the Indian residential schools, like they don't see their, that the amount of child abuse and pain and suffering they cause that ends up with a huge group of people who are homeless and then they have the audacity to look down on them for being homeless after they've just like 
dispossessed people all of this time. They have no concept of it. Like they are just so arrogant and ignorant. I, I just, I can't wrap my head around it. So, um, so for, for folks in Jasper, yeah, I'm sad you lost your home. Welcome to the club. I, I, I hate to say it that way, but you just don't get it. Like you don't see the pain and suffering you've literally caused by existing on somebody else's land, having the audacity to call us squatters and, um, you know, whatever other shitty labels you give us from. Um, and I see it all the time, social disorder. Social disorder is a nice way to say it. We don't like the effects that we did with colonialism. Can you just make that go away and put them in, in the uh, jails, please? That's what that is. So I, it's just sad that other people don't see it. Um, it's really pathetic. Anyway, um, what's even more pathetic was seeing Danielle Smith trying to cry her crocodile tears over Jasper. Like, seriously, I, I laughed. I was, I, I was waiting for my daughter to see it because I thought when she sees this, there is no way in hell she is not going to point and laugh. They're, like this younger generation, they are brutal. You think Gen X was bad. Oh, my God. You know, they're just so sweet and nice and will just say the most like, you know, soul crushing thing with just a few words and a smile and move on like they never even said anything. So I was waiting for that moment, but I never got it with my daughter. And understandably, she doesn't want to watch Daniel Smith ever. <laughs> um, I got a kick out of people trying to claim that she's a human. <laughs> if there was ever a case to be made about reptilian people, I think it's it's her. Anyway, her crocodile tears cracked me up. I love watching them every time. But the funniest moment, you guys, you're not even going to believe this. I don't know who her stupid media staffers are, but they actually tweeted out a picture of Banff National Park and put Jasper Strong on it. And then, of course, because they pay for the blue check, they edit it and then put a picture of Jasper. But the fact that they originally put a picture of Banff National Park, like, I'm like, oh, my God you colonizers you can't even right um I, i'm for folks who missed it uh the biggest tweet that they put out was we are trying to protect the infrastructure and the trans uh mountain pipeline uh, those are those are our priorities <laughs> colonizer priorities oh my god i should have that's the name of the episode it's going to be colonizer priorities <laughs> Oh my God, I feel awful for the fo poor folks of Jasper who were displaced. Um, and I will say, like I say in every single podcast, Indigenous governance, like you got to start listening to us. Um, climate change is real. Oh, that was the other thing. Watching the Premier and the UCP do everything they can to not mention climate change when talking about Jasper. Um, a lot of folks may not know this, but we've had here in uh, both Jasper and Banff this pine beetle. And it's been, when, when my husband and I used to scuba dive in Banff all the time, we had beautiful lush trees on the mountains, gorgeous pictures. I should try to find them and, and pop them up on the screen for folks, but they're they're just gorgeous. But since the time we were diving, which would be like 17 years ago, you know, the pine beetles have absolutely infested. And so now it, it doesn't even look like logging, but you can clearly see that all of the beautiful trees are just dead. And so a lot of people have said uh, the last few years that, you know, basically having a tinderbox waiting to happen, we had this massive heat wave. And so you're not going to believe this. So the day of Jasper wildfire, we had the worst air quality, like 10 out of 10. We had um, an earthquake that happened in Hinton. We had tornadoes for all of central Alberta that were, these were the warnings we were having in the middle of a heat wave. Like it was killer. Like the Satu Dene is not supposed to be in anything plus 19. So like plus 34 is insane for me, right? So we had all of these issues and the UCP and their premier going over themselves to not say the word climate change. Like, it's just so incredible. And again, you know, um, Indigenous governance. But what are their priorities? Fucking money. 
money, money, money and Trans Canada pipelines and, you know, making more money off of things like that. That's all they care about. They don't care about people, they don't care about the animals, nothing. And I'll tell you, like settlers and colonizers never have cared about the animals. You can see in the, all of their infrastructure. They don't save water for any of the animals. They don't give like skunks a place to cross. They don't like they just don't care about animals. Um, they don't care about birds. They don't care about nothing. It's just all they care about is making money. That's it. So it, it's so hard because to me, it's like, well, no wonder this happened. No, no wonder. Anyway. Something that's really funny to me as well is uh, our uh, in the States, going back to the States, Vice President Harris. So Vice President Harris is uh, Joe Biden steps down. She is going to be the Democratic uh, candidate. And uh, I think they have to still get it confirmed, confirmed. But um, they have their in two weeks, their own convention coming up where they make it official. So, uh, you know, she's going to be against Trump now. And it's been interesting watching uh, Black women react in in many ways to it. Uh, white women react in many ways and white men react in different ways. So for folks who want her elected, like they started White Men for uh, Harris, like websites, gear, everything. Uh, white women are being told, like, don't you drop the ball this time. And Black women being like, finally. However, I, I have to say this, and, and I struggled a lot with this with uh, when we had Jody Wilson Rainbow at first, you know, here you have uh, uh, the vice president, Harris, she was a cop, she was an, a, an, a district attorney, like a prosecutor. I did see that there were, weren't that many black men put into jail, as much as the original numbers came out, it was like single digits like not even double digits and so I thought that was really positive actually like that she was able to do that because I, I don't know if we could say the same of uh, you know indigenous prosecutors here basically preventing that and, and a really good book that we had read in our last year's book club actually addressed that where we talked about um, a lawyer who was or, you know uh, a defense lawyer and how he felt like alcohol is like the root of all the evil. Anyway, you have to go back in previous episodes for that book. If you're interested, I'll try to dig it up for you. Um, so I, I started sharing the memes that you have the Black Lives Matter uh, crowd. <laughs> who are tech or who are anti-cop now for her. So that's funny. And then you have like a convicted felon. And all the blue lives matter going and voting for the convicted felon. Like nothing in the States makes sense today. Absolutely nothing. But it, you know, I think obviously uh, Harris is better of the two, but uh, you know, again, it, it's like colonial politics up here where it's like, you know, the conservatives like literally want us dead. Don't care. Here's some body bags. And the liberals claim to care and claim to be for reconciliation and do the bare minimum <laughs> and, and i would argue what is that too uh but that said like i do think we have a lot of proud things to go but it, i just think because harper was such an evil person like i it, it's just black and white so easy to show i just wish that the bar was far higher so anyway one of justin's messages that i thought was really positive that came out of that was um we need good people to run and because of the toxicity, we're in a place where good people don't want to run. And we're seeing people not rerun because they're like, I don't want this to happen. And I'm sad because like, I want good people to run too. Um, in fact, somebody messaged me and said that they wanted me to run uh, federally. And I said, there's no way that the liberals would ever green like me actually because I've always been pro-Palestinian and they think that that's going to switch soon I don't know if that's going to switch soon uh frankly but um you never say never and if people were interested in having me run um I I would say this don't encourage me unless you're willing to write big checks because I um learned that from the last two times I ran 
is that uh, people who said you should run didn't volunteer and didn't donate and didn't endorse. So if you can't do those things, don't even bother telling people to run. And unfortunately, that just keeps the cycle of horrible people being in these positions of power. But to be fair, y'all vote for that. Like, my neighbors vote for that municipally, provincially, and federally. I'm not going to stop advocating for different, obviously, and and wish that people would get on board with that. But here we are. So anyway, um, I will say this for folks who are like, you know, I'm just so tired of Justin. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, fine. You're tired of Justin. So if you're listening to this podcast, then how, what is the answer with the conservatives? Because I have actually talked about the Indigenous economic strategy, and that's not part of their platform. If it was, even I would be having problems with. Okay. <laughs> but I know they don't. What like they, their plan is to keep us oppressed and claim uh, economic autonomy, which I know is untrue. And it just shows their ignorance of the inner Indian Act and the governance system as it is right now, as well as um, all the different orders of government. So, um, yeah, if you are a conservative supporter, probably best you quit listening to me and block me. And, and conversely, I'll do the same. You're welcome. <laughs> So the Olympics is happening. Aren't we happy? Yay, Olympics. But Canada already has a black eye. Before it even started, our women's soccer team was using drones illegally. And so, you know, this person had to step down, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, now all of our athletes are absolutely tarnished. And I would love to feel sorry for you all, but you're not committed to the TRC sports calls to action, so I don't really care. And second of all, it's just another example of the bullshittery of Canada. You know, I'm very proud that my people invented hockey, but look at how Hockey Canada has taken that and made it so dirty and disgusting. And the NHL rehiring dirty and disgusting coaches because they've served their time, whatever that means. It's just disgusting. I just, I, I'm disgusted with everything to do with Canada and the way they treat their children. It's not enough that you steal our children and you put them in abusive situations under the guise of angels of child welfare. No, no. You even have the stampede with the young Canadians being molested and everybody's cool with it because, you know, that's where the stampede, it's fine. Um, and and so, of course, that toxicity is in every aspect of anything to do with our sports, including women's soccer, which arguably needs help, not any sort of negative uh, press like this. So way to go, Canada, for you and your sports teams and, and you and your sports toxicity and your like pro child abuse ways of trying to win sports like I just. I cannot wrap my head around colonial disgustingness. I, I can't. I won't. It's gross. Um, this heat, man, it it really, really hurt me. I was uh I, I was out for over three days with a massive, massive headache. Um, I can't take this heat at all. So today is like a reprieve. It's like 20 degrees. Thank God. I don't know what I'm next week or even tomorrow, we're back to the like high twenties which is okay. But man, I kicked on the heater today, which is great. So, so I, I, I'm just going to ask you for your prayers and thoughts for my poor little Norton. So this poor little guy in the middle of this heat exhaustion, in the middle of um, this poor quality of air, which I would argue that uh, the smoke was what really gave me the headache, like that, that the heat was bad enough, the smoke for three days, I just had felt it right there. It was just gross. So this poor guy, he got 14 teeth pulled in the middle of that ugliness. And I just felt so bad. Um, when I'm my beagle, Roxy, she uh, got um, spayed. And now my poor little Norton Chihuahua getting his teeth pulled. Oh, I just feel like the worst parent ever because I you can't tell them why, you know, and I know everybody's like, you're such a good mom for doing it. Well, first of all, that's not true. I, I think that I'm I we had the finances to do it. And and so that doesn't make somebody a worse parent or a dog parent 
when they don't have the money, you know, like it, it's, uh, it feels horrible to do it to them. And I know the vets try as hard as they can to tell you it's a good thing, but it, it, it sucks watching your poor animals who trust you that you've made treaty with, like, look at you, like, why? And, and me just crying for like, I'm so sorry I did this to you. It feels horrible. So uh, he's doing really good today. Today is day four, but I just feel like an awful person for putting him through it. Um, the day we got him, they they thought he was about two. And uh, so we've, he, we think he's about 12. And his his teeth, like he's had stinky breath from the day one. So he probably needed teeth pulled then. Anyway um fast forward to today we pull out these 14 teeth two canines and um you know I got my first kisses from him that were stink free so I know it's helped his mouth I just know maybe in a week or two he'll be a little more to him like back to himself but for now I'm giving him all the drugs all the drugs to try to try to help him through it because I just feel awful that he has to go through all this pain and suffering and as a native, like it's really traumatizing and triggering for me to talk about the horrible dentistry that Canada does to us from childhood up to today. You know, they, they don't get it. Like we have different nerves. We have different ways of um, feeling pain. And because they hate us already, it's like there's an assumption that we're drug seeking rather than it's just painful because our nerves are built slightly different. So that's why you're always seeing natives trying to, you know, figure out, is there such a thing as a good dentist who will go through the colonial paperwork that Canada imposes on them? And, and again, back to that issue of Canada never understanding that their processes cause dentists to discriminate against us and we have no mechanism to do that and only now that we're starting to get a national dental plan are people starting to understand that and complain about it for when it happens to settlers um so i'm i'm i don't know what's going to happen there but i just know i feel like shit for doing that to my poor dog knowing the hope is it extends his life and quality of life in a good way and the dentist trying to assure me that he will have a better quality of life. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> oh, our book club that's coming up. I I found the author and I, I've been meaning to reach out to her, but I have ADHD and I get all this anxiety sometimes for reaching out. And um, she, from uh, you know, connected with me on LinkedIn. So we're connected. And the first thing I did when I opened the book was was stalker find her on on LinkedIn try to like all of her things because I, I didn't even know she was native right so I'm like now they know she's native of course I want to follow her but she's only on LinkedIn so uh first thing on her wall was this great study that she was a part of on indigenous dementia and I'm like this is my jam man so I was all excited to read that and then I got distracted so I still haven't even started her book yet so I hope you join me uh, because I do love reading the books. I just usually do it in the last minute because that's what ADHD demands. It's the, you know, I, I have to give more tobacco apparently to the overlords of the ADHD gods. So anyway, I hope you join us for our book club. I hope you enjoyed some of the previous books. I did get some feedback about the books that I recommended. Um, again, I forget a lot of you haven't been on this journey with me for like the last 17 years. So you forget the basics of lost harvests, clearing the plains, the importance of uh, monogamy. These are critical books for understanding the horrid policies that can Canada has imposed on us as Indigenous people. So why I have very little sympathy for your poor colonial settlements going up in smoke and um you know your lack of empathy and understanding for us it's always get over it right um those are really important books and i want to thank the reconciliation action group for putting together those book recommendations in a really nice post like they've been giving me really nice posts and i can't thank them all enough that's that's very sweet i appreciate that 
Uh, so uh, actually, if you want to join our reconciliation action group, we usually meet maybe every second Sunday, 7 p.m. You just have to reach out to them if you're a settler that actually wants to do some action as opposed to just sitting around doing absolutely nothing other than, you know, applauding Canada Day and the settlers that had to flee Jasper. <laughs> if that's your jam. Reconciliation action group, probably not for you anyway. Um, I'm proud of this prod podcast. I think unpacking a lot of the ADHD and undiagnosed autism has shown me that this podcast, while it's always been about my healing journey, it's about understanding it even further and deeper and knowing I can't mask this, whether it's white coding, whether it's gender coding, <laughs> whether it's mental health coding, I can't do it. I need a place to talk about these things that it seems so obvious to me, but is so oblivious to other people. And I don't understand why. So anyway, um, you know, if, if you're interested in creating a safer space for people of color, folks with disabilities, 2SLGBTQ, and of course, Indigenous people, I hope this is it. I hope this is a, a better space for that. And, um, you know, with the deepest respect to white, fragile feelings, like, I remember I caught an email from a group I actually like and they they contacted me asking about status and I was like well this is a I don't know if we're on the same page blah 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 but the reply I got was oh this is white fragility this isn't uh you know you were genuinely asking this was a you know, you didn't like my response. So you gave me a shitty response and that hurt my feelings for like three days. I couldn't quit thinking about it. So like, if you are going to give like an email, like if you don't understand mental health issues and if you're not trauma informed and you don't understand the plight of racialized people, like don't write, like, don't do that. Don't, don't add to our trauma with your crap plastic white fragility that's why we need safer spaces from your white fragility you have everything you have all the power all the control all the money all the oppressive tools to kill us you can deal with your fucking white fragility over there we need a place anyway according to the 2023 quality of life report from the calgary foundation 88 percent of racialized calgarians feel uncomfortable or out of place I brought all of this up to show people like I'm not alone. You might want to pretend and gaslight me, but I am not alone. Um, uh, 84% of racialized Calgarians believe racism exists and 66% of non-racialized Calgarians believe that racism exists. And that number is deplorable anyway. But I would even argue of that 66%, if they're going to send shitty emails to me, like they don't know what racism actually is like they don't, they don't have that white fragility figured out yet and they still like impose it on a, a stupid email like don't email me if you're gonna be an asshole um thank you to cheryl ward chelsea branch Ch uh, alicia fritkin of here to help .bc .ca. they have a great uh section on what is indigenous cultural safety and why i should care about it so like don't email me if you haven't read that. Like, don't do it. Absolutely not. Or pay me $1,000 to read your stupid email. Uh, their work and those cultural action tools are available. Like, just Google Indigenous cultural safety. How hard is that? I just highlight and repeat it all here. Um, internalized racism or lateral violence. Oh, this will be exciting to talk more about this with uh, Vice President Harris running. Uh, because, you know, in, in one way, you have this accomplished person like Jody Wilson Rainbow, who were accomplished people in massive positions of power. Um, you know, obviously having people being like, but hey, you did this to us. So that's internalized racism, lateral violence wouldn't exist if it wasn't for white supremacy and white fragility, but here we are. So Donna Bevins, who she you should give money to, she's at racialequitytools.org. Tons of resource files, including one on internalized racism, which really breaks down why it is that uh, you will see, you know, Black people attack Black people or Indigenous people at attack Indigenous people. Um, so, so read about that. And if you are a person of color in any capacity, whether you're Brown, Indigenous, uh, Black, you know, 
these are things that we have to work on too, so that we don't perpetuate it. Like I very rarely will post, um, you know, one of our people being convicted because in my opinion, the system's rigged against them. But like, I would love to post uh, settlers that hurt indigenous people that got convicted, but that just never happened. So I can't. <laughs> so I wish people understood what, you know, racism, all of these intersections, what that causes. Anyway, um, do's and don'ts for bystander intervention by American Friends Service Committee. So you can go to AFSC.org. I know I've said this a million times, but I still people not not stand up for other people of color in situations where they're being attacked based on that. So if you're in Calgary and you see or experience racism, you can report it at acttoendracism.ca. It's more of an Asian-based organization. Uh, you can also text them at 587-507-3838. Uh, I wish anyone who follows me on social media would watch the anti-racism organizational lead for the city of Calgary. Um, he gave a uh, presentation on the journey of becoming an anti-racism leader. Well, I'd love to see Calgary filled up with more of those. Um, Adora, Adora Nolfor and Taylor McNally are part of our Calgary Black Lives Matter group. Please follow Stop the Stack YYC. And I'll also say that we have a, a queer male friend of ours who was wrongly targeted by the Calgary police. And he had to take a plea deal in order to deal with, literally, we had a protest on the day to end um, homophobia, transphobia. It, this stupid prick from Ontario came out to do this protest, completely protected by the Calgary police because he's white. And he came to a school on a school day to actually protest. And so we did a counter protest. And this queer white male from Calgary had to take a plea deal because he can't, can't afford the stupid oppressive systems thing. Like fighting this is ridiculous. Anyone who thinks we have a fair system has absolutely never been uh, targeted by the police ever and have never had to deal with the legal uh, team. And I'll tell you, as somebody who was court ordered to do counseling as a kid, those mofos never figured out that I had ADHD or autism. So like none of the system works. It's all bull. And the only reason why it exists is to literally keep Indigenous people in jails so that you can all feel good about stealing our land until we die. And I, I just think that's deplorable. And the fact that there's not more settlers doing more about it, it's disgusting. So now we have Taylor McNally and Adora Nufort living a legacy of anti-Blackness in this world. And you have um, our queer community living this legacy of anti-queerness and being um oppressed by this colonial system and y'all don't see it like I, I can't wrap my head around it and I'll I'll even share you know Palestinians who need uh funds and white people who literally never have ever listened to a single one of my episodes who have never posted on my page they'll be like I'm pretty sure this has been shown already to not be legitimate and this isn't the first time I've had many people say this over the course of many GoFundMes that I have shared. And I just, I'm so sad. That's white supremacy. If it doesn't say the Red Cross and I can't get a tax receipt, then it must be illegitimate. And that's not the case. So if you're a settler listening to this and you see that we're sharing, um, you know, a GoFundMe for an Indigenous family who lost their home in a fire, for an Indigenous family who lost a family member and need funds in order to go collect the body and have a funeral? Like, how white supremacist Nazi do you have to be to be like, I don't think this is legitimate? You, What have you done for any research to know that? I just don't share those GoFundMes willy-nilly. I'm so saddened by so many people that they are willing to believe a lie to perpetuate oppression. Anyway, whatever. Now you know how I feel about you. <laughs> Help stop the stack YYC is my bottom line. Indigenous people have been talking about our issues and sharing our traumas and reports, commissions, and public hearings just so it can be regularly disregarded. No more. Honor our words. Honor the treaties. Listen to politicians and their policies and their platforms. If they don't recognize marginalized people in their budget, 
with gender equity plus if they're cutting violence prevention programs and services indigenous education uterus health choices case trade alliances lack of human rights for migrants immigrants folks with disabilities know that your vote to that party is negatively impacting marginalized people um this i hear people say you know woke uh dei in negative ways and it's like I can criticize DEI because they never come from an anti-colonial lens, but they're criticizing it because they just want white men in power. And it's just so pathetic. And it, that's what this conversation is. Uh, demand that they implement the TRC's calls to actions, the recommendations of RCAB, multiple reports about child welfare reform, the violence prevention, 231 calls to justice from the National Inquiry on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls, and Two-Spirit. You know, we have the 113 pathways to justice here for Alberta. Uh, I just had a, a friend of mine who's been so supportive to me since the start of my podcast and just learning who Jack White Goose Flying was and the report municipally, despite all of their community work, they do municipally. So like you all have to understand that denying these reports to me is a, a form of abuse. It's gaslighting. Uh, we experience extreme racism in every institution with multiple reports that say the same thing. Demand change from election platforms and politicians. If they don't understand colonialism, racism, privilege, sexism, ableism, they have zero business running. Should be understood by everybody, but even community associations, sports clubs. Um, you know, I, I told the story of Last Stampede being in the line. And the community association encouraging the white person in front of me, but none of the native people, none of the black people to be a part of their community association. Don't claim to me that you can't understand why we don't have more diversity at our boards when clearly you you understand very well. Um, even our sports clubs. I mean, obviously, I went on a rant about how shitty sports clubs are and uh, the Olympics being, uh, you know, grand case of it internationally. Anyway, you can Google articles on how Canadians can become allies to Indigenous people. Uh, the Calgary Foundation has a great ally toolkit. I've talked a lot about sharing, please, from the Missing Children's Society of Canada, as well as the AboriginalAlert.ca. These are legitimate places that you can share from. I, I just, I'm so sad, and I've had this conversation now a few times that, um, you know, I share from directly from the families, because at the end of the day, the RCMP, municipal police, provincial police, federal police, they don't care about some of the details. So, for example, we've had children, we've had teens mixed up and the police being like, oh, no, they're fine. And the family being like, no, they're not. They're missing. That's not our kid. And them going, no, they're fine and not recognizing they made a mistake, never owning up to it. So if you, you're not sharing, um, you know, from the family, Aboriginal Alert, the Missing Society of Canada, like you're not helping. And these police reports, sometimes they take a day or two to give us a case file because we're natives. And I, I am just awestruck by the amount of people that don't understand this. Um, Obviously, we have this drug crisis issue still happening. I try to give out as many Narcan as I can. Everyone should have Narcan and Naloxone on them, just like you would a Band-Aid. Please consider your role in helping people with this. If you know someone who is using substances, or if you are using, please don't use alone. If you are using alone, you can use the National Overdose Response Service at 888-688-NORS. There's also a Brave Doors and Lifeguard app that you can use. Um, I strongly support Freedoms Path Recovery Society.ca. You can donate to them. They provide free one on one addictions counseling services, group treatment for recovery in Canada. They're queer friendly and they're anti racist. Um, also, many of you have heard I fully support Canada's first 2S LGBTQ addiction recovery center of stonewallrecovery.ca. And I'm a big proponent because I'm a facilitator for mending broken hearts. 
And I encourage people to learn more about wellbriety and having that Indigenous lens of helping people through their addictions and through their traumas, mostly imposed by the colonial state. Uh, if you're experiencing emotional distress after anything I talked about today and you need to talk, call the First Nation and Inuit Hope for Wellness Helpline at 855-242-3310. It's open 24-7. Uh, you can also go to hopeforwellness.ca. They have a little text box there. If you are uh, feeling a little upset about missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit, you can also call 844 844- 413-6649. I wanted to mention we have a 60 Scoop Indigenous Society of Alberta, SSISA.ca. I don't think they give crisis counseling per se, but I think when you are a 60 Scoop person, these are important things to have with you uh, in order to continue your healing journey. Indian Residential School Survivor and Family Hotline is 866-925-4419. Kids Help Phone, 1-800-668-6868. You can text 686868. And they actually have a live chat from 7 p.m. to midnight at Eastern Time. And the Native Youth Crisis Hotline is 877-209-1266. The LGBT Youth Line no longer exists, but you can text at 647-694-4275 or go to youthline.ca. For non-Indigenous, there's usually a distress center line in your area, a functioning 211, and the new national number of 988. You can also text 988 or go to 988.ca. For our queer community, I wanted to say that Toronto has this wonderful new initiative Literally, all you have to do is call 211 if you're in a very specific uh, area of Toronto. Our American Two Spirit folks, strong parts helpline.org, 1 844 7 Native or 1 844 762 8433. It gets better, Canada.org has lots of resources for 2SLGBTQ. Warning for the QT BIPOC, I've seen some of the organizations in Alberta listed and not all of them practice anti-racism nor have Indigenous education, so you may want to try the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls, and Two-Spirit line, and I look forward to the day we don't have this massive gap. Like, regularly, I have called out for years a bunch of our um, queer organizations, prominent ones, almost always white people as the big spokesperson. I seen one of them, I won't name them, and they finally acknowledged Two Spirit in their acronym and in their wording. I don't know who finally took them aside and said, "You, hey, this is important, you fucking racist. But they did, so thank God. So I wish queer community I wish Canadians would understand this massive, massive gap. And uh, even the Reconciliation Action Group were trying to deal with a young a youth and um, their family. And the gap is so clear and uh, ah, just driving me crazy. Anyway, um, we'll just blame that on ADHD and autism. <laughs> Violence is my everyday reality. Every Indigenous organize, or generation faces it in some capacity. This is self-care for me. I've said that now seeing to the intersectionality of autism and ADHD. Anyway, but this is how I take my power back. I can't hold this in. Um, it's why I started the podcast. Because I need to speak freely without interruption. I get interrupted by so many people with questions that are not relevant, distracting me from the point I was trying to make. Uh, tone policing. As a woman, you should not say that. As a native, you should know your place. If you're not just a good little object for me to pat my head on, then you just have too much of a voice. That's tone policing, folks. Uh, leadership shaming. A lot of folks don't believe that women should have a um, you know, voice at all. We're seeing that. Gaslighting questions, like, are you sure that's what happened? Ugh, I don't have time for it anymore, folks. Um, especially people who don't know anything about Indigenous people, colonialism, 
the constant surveillance of indigenous people like you don't realize that we are being monitored by the police i've given books on this and people are like are you sure yeah i'm sure i'm sure that little white kid from rebel news can go and be on the beach with my prime minister but i have a fucking red lanyard around my neck that says liberal and i get an elbow to the face by their stupid fucking detail so yeah i know it happens and the fact you don't shows your privilege and your racism anyway they monitor our protests our vigils and our rights i and many others share this daily so it's just sad and pathetic that people don't see it anyway learn about being trauma-informed uh, folks like me are dealing with internalized racism, gatekeeping, other folks who survive off the status quo, and we are unpacking our trauma. And this just depletes so many per personal resources. So lucky you for folks who can have the capacity to reclaim a language that was purposely stolen. I'm, I'm barely surviving here, folks. Um, Internal, external racism is an everyday reality for me, other Indigenous peoples, folks with disabilities, QT, BIPOC, and others. Uh, Masi Cho to my ancestors, to my granny and my mom of what strength looks like through your example. I want to thank my dad for teaching me to be strong and blunt. Autism. Red flag. My stepmom for showing me what a proud culture is through her Austrian family and roots. And teaching me to be a proud Calgarian. I think about her right now. She's going through the hardest time. And I am so worried about her. Anyway, it is through her. I am a second generation Calgarian. Uh, thank you to my husband for producing and editing this show. Being my childhood friend, father of our child, and support during of my journey down the red road. Witnessing decades of racism and sexism. And to our child, we are blessed to learn from you daily and honored you chose us. I swear this Gen X, we are we're feral and mean so that we were ready for this next generation because you guys are vicious <laughs> in your kindness and in your words. Anyway, you give me daily accountability to be a better and stronger person. I hope that my child and my family will be proud in the future of us discussing these present day issues in a way that they can understand i honor the blackfoot as the elders and members have been so kind to me on my red road journey elder red crane taught me how to pronounce my name in blackfoot leonard kenny taught me how to pronounce my name in satu dene my humblest apologies to all of the elders and language keepers as i try to learn proper pronunciation and uh, yeah, and I'm just going to exclude Blackfoot and, and Dede and say all of you, including the Stony. you can all see me struggling the last little while trying to learn this pr pronunciation. Um, and I, I'm just going to keep doing it until I finally get it. And because I, I need to lead by example as well. My patron account is Native Calgarian that you can pledge and support. Thank you, previous donors, for showing your support. If you value listening or watching and can afford to give, thank you. For those who cannot afford to give, I'd love to hear from you at nativeyyc at gmail.com, where you can send in your comments or your questions. I also have a YouTube channel that you can go and subscribe. You can go to nativecalgarian.com for the latest podcasts and pin posts on social media. And uh, I wanted to start introducing this touch grass moment, and I'll totally give Ryan Jesperson the shout out for that, although he has harmed someone in my life that really hurts my feelings. Um there are a lot of dark things we talk about on social media and uh, media in general. So I really want to try to, you know, talk about positive things as well. And I'd love to hear from you if you have something positive that you would like to send me. I wanted to touch on that today is the Calgary Folk Fest. And I've been lucky enough to be invited to open with ceremony with some of the other elders in the community the last few years now. And that's, of course, thanks to Marilyn North Pagan, who was on their board and has been a volunteer. Uh, Tony Snow, years of being a volunteer there as well. So I just want to give a shout out to all the natives trying to work with the folks on this. Um, we've had some really cool Indigenous musicians come as a result of their fantastic work. But I think what I really, I, I don't like to share ceremony in general because white people have stolen everything and I don't want 
anyone listening to this to think that this somehow gives them permission to do what we do because it doesn't. Um, the small bit of rights I have to do certain things, I've had to work really hard and earn them. So any white people who just appropriate them, like you're a disgusting human being. Um, regardless, the Calgary Folk Fest, trying to do uh, good reconciliation work, and over the past few years have you know worked with elders. And before it opens, they do ceremony to try to start off the whole island in a good way and hopefully prevent some negative things from happening and I I just have like that's what we should all be doing and I I'm sad that other people don't see that this is the way we should be conducting ourselves as treaty partners so hats off to the Calgary Folk Fest uh, for all the participants I hope you have a wonderful time thank god this heat wave has ended and the smoke isn't as bad, so I'm hoping everyone can enjoy themselves. And I prayed for safety. I uh, won't get in too much into that, but um, I, they took the nicest photo of me ever and posted it up online. And I uh, appreciate that as well. That's that's really kind. And I appreciate them trying to work with the local communities to do better. I wish other nonprofits other organizations would follow their example. So I want to give a shout out to them. And this 18 year old Jasper hiker who helped lead out a bunch of campers to safety. That was such a great story. That made me happy. Um, really proud of, of that person and telling the story of cutting down like 63 trees. And so knowing to count the 63 stumps and knowing how to get out, like such a great story. Uh, really proud of her. So with that, I will end by giving side eye to those Calgary rabbits. You're lucky I'm not tradish. And my beautiful, oh, I got to tell one more story. I got to tell one more story. My dog got in a tussle. He opened the door. It was locked, but his, he, like he's strong and he forced it open. And this cat in my yard, they, the cat just attached to him and they tumbled on my front yard and finally the cat escaped and I was holding my dog from his back hind legs because that's what Caesar Milan taught me and some other dog trainers and so I'm holding him so the cat finally gets away comes in the house it's hot as hell like this is, had to be the last day of the heat comes in and we're like how bad are you and we're looking at all his scratches and there's a freaking claw right embedded on him so we pull it out and put it up and he sat there for hours smiling and panting like he like so proud of himself. So I just any animal, if you're on my property, it's going to get you. Don't do it. Do not do it. The animal, uh, the, the cat is alive. I've seen it walking. But so don't worry about the cat. It lost a, a claw, clearly a do claw, but <laughs> they tumbled. So I wash this stupid dog. So he smells like wet dog and he's smiling and panting and proud of himself. Oh, so that was really funny too. So again, side eye to those Calgary rabbits. Not just my dish you've got to worry about, man. <laughs> Thanks folks for listening. I so appreciate you so much.